Welcome to our town hall. This is Tom Wheelwright. I'm the host. I am the founder and CEO of WealthAbility. So very good to be with you tonight. Very important topic. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you how big of a change is being proposed in Congress right now. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually talk about what's in the bill. We're going to talk uh, as it is right now uh, that's been proposed by the House Ways and Means Committee. I'm gonna walk you through what I think will likely end up in the bill. And then I'm gonna walk you through how the, um, how the bill actually will proceed through, okay? Because a lot of the questions I'm getting right now is when's this gonna happen? When are we gonna know? And, uh, and, and I'm gonna walk you through how that happens because there's a very specific uh, um, process that the bill has to walk through in order to, um, in order for us to be able, in, in order for the bill to be enacted. So I wanna go through that as well. So I wanna start, um, and hang on just a second, excuse me, but I gotta adjust my camera. There we go, now you get to see everything. Okay, you get to see the whole board here. So what I wanna do, like I said, I wanna walk through a little bit. As I mentioned, this is a massive uh, change and it's not just a massive tax change, it's a massive policy change. Um, as many of you know, as many of you have read my book, Tax-Free Wealth, you know that the tax law is a series of incentives. And so how these incentives work um, and what the incentives are is a major part of this bill. So we have incentives and we have disincentives. And I'm going to walk you through both of those, both the incentives and the disincentives, because there are some uh, hidden disincentives. And there are some great incentives. I've got to tell you, um, people ask, well, won't this just completely destroy your tax planning? No, it'll just, it, it may shift uh, our tax planning, but we're going to be able to actually reduce our taxes even more. So that's the good news about this bill. The bad news is that I think there will be some, there always are unintended consequences. We're going to see some of those, um, particularly in the corporate tax area. Uh, as we go through that. Now, let me tell you right now, as of today, uh, originally this bill is proposed, was supposed to be about a three and a half trillion, though some people say it's really five trillion, but in any case, about a three and a half trillion dollar bill. Uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Kirsten Cinema of my home state, Arizona, have said, no, that's gotta come down. Now, Joe Manchin has said 1.5 trillion, so just a small bill, right, 1.5 trillion. Uh, Kirsten Sinema really hasn't set a target. She's rather looking for specific things to happen. And what we'll probably end up with is about a $2 trillion bill. And we'll talk about what will probably go in there. So when you look at this bill, and again, remember, the law is a series of incentives. You look at this bill, there's really three categories to be looking at. One is the tax rates because um, unless Kirsten Sinema gets her wish, now she said she doesn't want any tax rate increases. We'll see. I think we will, I think she will compromise on that. Um, frankly, I hope she compromises because the alternative, the alternatives to increasing tax rates, if they're still going to do a $2 trillion bill, are not good. Uh, the alternative to, to raising tax, tax rates are probably, in fact, where the tax rates are targeted right now, probably not horrible, okay, as you're gonna see. Uh, so tax rates are step number one. Number two are the hidden increases. Now the hidden increases are far greater than the tax rate increases, okay? The, the, the hidden increases, tax increases, are two to three times the amount of the tax rate increases. So that's, an, that's important to remember. So there's a lot, it's what you don't see, can be way more important than what you do see. So I'm gonna, my, my goal here is to help you see it and uh, help you know what to do to plan for it because there are some things that you can do between now and the end of the year. The last thing is tax benefits. As I mentioned, there are some serious incentives in this bill. In fact, there are some incentives that are so good, it's hard to believe how good they are. Um, th there are some incentives that are just astronomical incentives to the point where um, if you 
follow these incentives and have good tax planning. You're gonna to have to have some a really good tax advisor to do this. But if you do this right, you may never pay tax again under this bill. So that's the good news. So let's kind of walk through, um, I'm gonna walk through the tax rates first and I'm gonna show you what I think the tax rates are gonna end up. But I wanna kind of explain those tax rates. First, we have the individual tax rate. Now, remember, we have a very progressive tax system. Remember also that these tax rates are the federal income tax rates and do not include state income tax. So, for example, if you end up in effectively a 40% tax bracket and you live in California, you could really be in a 53%. And as we're going to see, you could actually end up in a 60% tax bracket. So I'm going to show you because one of the tax rate increases, there, there's a couple of taxes that are very much hidden taxes um, that we need to talk through. And the individual rates, here's what's going to happen. Not only are the individual rates going up, but it's not like they're taking the existing brackets and just moving the top bracket from 37% to 39.6%. That is what a lot of people have been led to believe. I'm telling you right now, that is not what's going on. So right now, the, the top tax bracket, say, for Mary is over $600,000. they are going to lower that top tax bracket. So what's really going to happen is, as Joe Biden promised during his campaign, people under $400,000 will not have any direct taxes, um, by the way, unless they use tobacco. So they're not going to have any direct taxes they're only gonna have indirect taxes. We'll talk about that when we get to corporate tax increases. So that means that it, but it also means that if you're over 400,000, you're clearly not in the top tax bracket. You're in a 30, 30 plus percent tax bracket. You're gonna to go to a 35% from where you are now. You may be in a 32%, go to a 35%. I think I've got those rates right. You may go from a 35% to a 39.6%. So it's not as simple as you think it is. It's not just a 2.6% tax increase. For some people, it's going to be 5, 6, 7% tax increase. Just recognize that. And it's not, by the way, this is not a tax on the wealthy. This is the tax on the moderately successful. Okay, so this is, a, a, the major tax here is on upper middle income. Successful business owners um, in particular are really going to be hit hard uh, based on how this tax law is written. I'm gonna go through some of those hidden tax costs because you'll see that it's the, it's the business owner that makes between 400,000 and 2 million that's gonna get hit the hardest. That's who's gonna get hit the hardest. So let's look at these tax rates. So first of all, individual, they go up to 35 to 39.6%. So when you're calculating, how is this gonna impact me again, don't believe that if you're below the 37% bracket, you're not going to be impacted. You will be impacted if you're over 400,000. Okay. Second of all, part of that, the marriage penalty once again gets increased. So let me explain the marriage penalty. And I'm going to give you my personal example here. Okay. So uh, <laughs> six years ago, I got married um, for the second time. I got married. And uh, my wife's a very successful business owner and I'm a moderately successful business owner. And uh, we actually calculated at the time, the marriage penalty, the marriage penalty. In other words, how much was our tax going to increase by getting married versus by us just living together single? And the answer was about $33,000. That's how much that, we call that a marriage penalty. That penalty is going up under this new law, because um, the, when you're married, that difference between single and married, uh, you may want to really calculate, if you're thinking, do I get married or not? I'm dead serious about this. Um, ignore the religious or what any, anything else you want to, but if you're looking purely at the numbers, you want to calculate that. You're gonna to wanna to calculate that under this um, proposal because the chances are your taxes uh, um, could go up way more than 33,000. They could go up 50, 60,000. So that's a, that's a very big differential. That marriage penalty is getting bigger 
under this bill. Corporate tax rates. So this is interesting. So um, under this proposal, some corporations actually lower their tax rate. So remember, the current tax rate for corporations is 21% for all corporations. We don't have a graduated, we don't have marginal tax breaks, we don't have a graduated rate. Under this bill, we would. We would have three rates. We'd have an 18% rate, a 21% rate, and a 20, what I think will end up being a 25% rate. Okay, now, right now it's proposed at 26.5. I don't think it'll go above 25. Um, that's just my personal opinion. We'll see how good my crystal ball is in a month from now. But that means if you're under 500,000, you're at an 18% rate. This should make you start thinking about, well, maybe I want to be a corporation. Maybe you want to, this is a C corporation, right? Not an S corporation where it's passed through to you, but a C corporation. So you might be an 18% rate. It's not till you get up $5 million that you're at that 25% rate. So for the, for the medium, the, the, the small to mid-sized business, your tax rate's not going up, your corporate tax rate's not going up, particularly if you don't do business overseas. Now, let's talk about um, the corporate tax. I wanna talk about some of the hidden ones when we get to the hidden um, costs um, in, in this bill. But at a 25% rate, remember, it's not a 25% rate. It's a 31, 30 to 35% rate, depending on what the state tax is. So remember that you've got to include the state tax when you're comparing to the US companies to other countries. The reason behind the 21% rate when it was enacted in 2017, and by the way, that's the one, one of the few areas in that law that, were per, that was made permanent, supposedly, until the Democrats came along to, and decided to change it but it was made permanent. The reason is because the goal was to make the US a favorable place to do business. Our tax rate was this 35% plus state taxes. So we are a 40% tax rate. We were by far the highest tax rate in the world, by far for corporations. And you're going, well, why do I care? I mean, I'm under $5 million. I'm not gonna be in that 25% rate. Well, think about where your pension plan is. Think about where your 401k is. Think about where your IRA is. It's, it's probably in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And let's stick with the stocks and mutual funds. Well, that means that those are gonna have less income, right? Less cash flow. And remember, all stocks are valued based on cash flow. And so if you reduce the cash flow, the value comes down. We've seen a huge uptick in the market since 2017. Why? primarily because of the tax rates, okay? I would, I would argue that in large part, that's because of the tax rates. Um, so what's gonna happen is you're, you are gonna see, you'll probably see actually a dip in the market is what I would predict. Um, we'll see how much of a dip in the market. Uh, right now, the market's probably including some of this in the pricing because the stock market always prices going forward, um, not going backwards. And so, uh, it might be priced in, but it might not be. Uh, the stock market uh, might be waiting to see. The market may actually be waiting to see what happens. Uh, so you could see a dip in the market. Just know that it will impact it. It, it really impacts uh, two primary groups. Remember, a corporation is not a person. So there, it's not an individual. So you're not raising taxes on some mythical rich person. You're raising taxes on the workers they, it's been found that they pay a lot of the tax and you're raising taxes on the investors, which for the most part are, or to a large extent, are pension plans, profit sharing plans, and 401ks and IRAs. So just keep that in mind, you know, when people talk about, oh, well, you know, we're just going to tax corporations. This is frankly, um, if you um, if you want a little bit more information on this, I would go to the Tax Foundation, taxfoundation.org. Uh, they have a really good analysis of this. And in their opinion, the worst part of this bill is the corporate tax increase. 
So keep that in mind. It's again, it's not a direct tax on people making 400,000, but it is a tax on anybody that's invested in the market in any way, shape or form. Even if it's their pension plan, let's say you're a school teacher and you have, and, and you have, you're in a pension plan, guess what? That pension plan is invested in the stock market. That's it's pretty much only invested in the stock market and it could, it will you know, likely be affected. Next, capital gains. Capital gains are scheduled the top rate to go from 20% to 25%. But let's talk about that top rate because it's not really 25%. We have another tax called the net investment income tax. And the net investment income tax is the equivalent to Medicare tax. It's 3.8%. So it's not really going from 20 to 25, the maximum rate. It's going from 238 to 28.8. On top of that, we have the surtax. If your income's over $5 million, you've got a 3% surtax. So that means that truly the maximum capital gains rate will be 31.8% plus state taxes. So again, if you go back to California, you could be over a 40% tax rate for your capital gains. Keep that in mind. Now, one of the questions that I get asked all the time is, well, is this going to be retroactive? Well, it depends on who you talk to, right? Um, Kirsten Cinema has said she does not want anything retroactive. We'll see. It hasn't been pulled out yet. I would encourage you, by the way, if you don't want anything retroactive, which, by the way, is just horrible tax policy because it means you can't predict what's going to happen, um, then write, write your senator, uh, write your Democratic senator, write your write your congressperson, your, your uh, uh, Democratic congressperson, and say, look, we don't want things retroactive. I, I would highly encourage that if that's where you are, okay? Um, if you want the increase, uh, you're probably not listening to this. But if, if, if you want the, the, the increases, that, that's fine too. You know, uh, uh, go ahead and write your senator and encourage them. Um, but if you don't, um, you, they listen, okay? I, I will tell you that. They do listen to their constituents. So here's basically the rates. Now, let's talk about the hidden. And I'm gonna start with the hidden in the corporate area. Um, in, and this is a little technical, um, and it's not going to affect you directly, but it will affect you indirectly. Uh, what they've recently done, uh, they negotiated, and this is Janet Yellen, our treasury secretary, and uh, basically treasury secretaries around the world, have negotiated a, min, a, a global minimum tax of 15%. The reason that the US was so, the, the Biden administration was so adamant about doing that is because they don't want the US tax rate at 25% to be so poorly compared to other countries. Now, in addition to the 25 versus 15, what they're also looking at is there's these two hidden taxes. One's called Fitty and the other one's called Guilty. And it's actually called Guilty, okay? And these two, the, in the bill as proposed, those, both, those taxes go up as well. And what they end up is they end up over 15%. So there was some real tax benefits for international corporations that came in in 2017. So what that means is that this is a much bigger tax increase than 20 to 20, 21 to 25%. This will actually be more like a 21 to 30% tax increase for, the, for most companies. So just realize that that's what's in the bill. Again, probably nothing you can do about it unless you're you know, involved in a multinational corporation, um, but just know that that's in there and could it have a, an impact on your stock prices? Absolutely. In fact, I think it will. And remember also that that 15% global minimum tax, there are countries that aren't going to actually implement that for many years, including uh, Ireland. Now, why is Ireland important? Ireland's important because um, Ireland is where all of the major corporations relocate so that they have a, a lower tax rate on that income. Uh, for example, Google. Apple, They're, they have some headquarters in Ireland, so they get that 12.5% rate on their non-US income, their global income. Well, could we have more of those, what we call inversions? Could we have that more of that 
um, companies leaving the US? I think that's highly likely, depending on how they write the rules, but I think it's highly likely. Just know that because again, it's not a direct tax on you. It may, however, be an indirect tax by reducing the value of your stock portfolio. All right, so now look, let's look at some of the other um, primary hidden uh, tax increases. The first one I want to talk about is estate tax. Uh, I know that there are a lot of you that are, your, your, your wealth, uh, that is your, your balance sheet on your personal financial statement is less than $6 million and you don't think it's gonna be more than $6 million in the foreseeable future. Don't worry about the state tax because what's gonna happen is, um, and this one is very likely, is they're going to reduce the exclusion is currently 11.7 million down to somewhere between five and 6 million. Now that's per person. And that means that spouses each get their own. So that means it's basically going from 23 and a half million down to roughly half of that. If you are more than 10 million, okay, um, particularly if you're more than 10 and less than 23, there's some absolute tax planning that you wanna do now between now and the end of the year. You need to get with your attorney, your accountant tomorrow. I'm not kidding you because uh, the attorneys I know are all overwhelmed, the estate planning attorneys. So you're gonna to have to kind of weasel your way in and convince your estate planning attorney that you need to do this right now. Um, if, if you need to do some estate planning because you don't want your kids uh, to pay a huge amount of tax when you die, then you need, you need to do it between now and the end of the year. This, this, um, most of the proposals, by the way, are prospective. And hopefully they all will be. Uh, right now we know that two they've talked about are not prospective. One is the um, capital gains tax, rate increase, that is supposedly not prospective. That's back to September 13th of 2021. And the other one is uh, a very odd provision where they want to actually penalize people from all the way back to 2016 um, who, invest in what, who, who invest in what's called a conservation easement. So, um, but most of it starts January 1st of 2022. The estate tax is one of those. And so there's a lot of planning that can be done, but you have to do it before the end of the year. Net investment income tax. Now I mentioned this. Remember, this is a 3.8% tax. And currently it applies on investment income, meaning capital gains, um, meaning interest and dividends. What it does not apply to currently are earnings from your company, like your S corporation or your partnership that pass through to you and are taxed to you um, instead of taxed to the company. Not in there. This bill would change that. And again, it's that $400,000 limit, right? Um, but if your income's over that, which many small businesses are, uh, many family home owned businesses or closely held businesses are, then you would pay that additional 3.8%. So again, your tax increase may not be from 35 to 39.6. It may be from 35% to um, uh, 42.4%. Okay, so keep that in mind. The, the tax rates keep getting bigger for the um, successful small business. So I think that's actually a big hidden tax. Will it go through? Who knows? My guess is yes, because I haven't seen anything that says that it won't. So I think you can plan on that. Qualified plans. Now let me explain what a qualified plan is. <laughs> when the government says it's a qualified plan, it means it's a government controlled plan. And these are retirement plans. So here's what this bill proposes. The bill proposes that um, two things, two major differences, well, three. Let's give you all three, okay? First of all, some of you have rolled over your regular IRA to a Roth IRA or regular 401k to a Roth 401k. What this would do is prohibit that after a certain income level. 
So you wouldn't be able to take, let's say you, you've got, for example, a million dollars in your pension plan, or you couldn't roll that into our Roth 401k, which you could today. So some of you will want to do that rollover before the end of the year. Just recognize that, again, this is another one where you probably want to do it between now and the end of the year. You, you may want to do a Roth rollover. If you've been thinking about rolling over your regular IRA to a Roth IRA, or your regular 401k to a Roth 401k, for example, or your pension plan into a Roth 401k, you may want to do that. You want to be talking to your tax advisor, your wealth ability um, advisor between now and the end of the year, okay? So that we can get that done. Now, remember, uh, assuming this goes through, which there's no indication it won't, uh, there's going to be a lot of people wanting to do this. And so you need to let your plan administrator know ahead of time. Again, this is something where you need to plan now because otherwise you're going to be up against the deadline and nobody's going to be able to help you. And so that's going to be a problem. So do not wait on that one. Number two, so that's the Roth rollover. Number two is a limit. And again, granted, this won't affect a whole lot of you, um, where you have more than $10 million in a pension plan or your combined pension 401k and IRA. If you do, you're going to have to distribute that out. Now, we don't know how that's going to work um, because it, that, by the way, is effectively a retroactive tax change, right? Because what you're saying is, um, I put all that money in when that was the law. Now we're going to kind of go back and say, well, that's not the law anymore. Now, now you can only have 10 million and we're going to make you distribute it. Will they make you distribute it all in one year? We don't know. Will it be over five years? Will it be over two years? Will it be over three years? We don't really know how that's going to shake out, um, but stay tuned. Just know that $10 million right now is that, is that limit. The third thing, this is a really interesting one. Um, and let me explain, first of all, what's a syndication? So a, a syndicated investment is one where you have, say, a real estate developer, and they find a project, and they need two things. They need money from the bank, and they need money, they need the down payment, which is coming from investors. So they get maybe 30, 40 investors together who all put in anywhere from $100,000 to a $1 million. And then they go out and they, they buy this property. There are some of you who have invested in these syndications through your IRA. That will no longer be available under this bill. Uh, an IRA will not be able to invest in any investment that requires you to be an accredited investor. And most syndications do require, they only allow accredited investors. So therefore, effectively, what it's saying is that an accredited invest, if, if, if you're investing through your IRA, you're not gonna be able to do that. I will tell you, I'm not a big fan of investing in a syndication through an IRA in the first place. Uh, and the reason is, is because you lose all the tax benefits that come from real estate if you invest through an IRA. Even a Roth IRA, you lose all the tax benefits. So um, you're basically turning a non-taxable transaction into a taxable transaction. I'm not a big fan of that. There are some things you can do between now and the end of the year to deal with this, okay? Some of it may be distributing your money out of your IRA. You may want to do that this year. Rather than roll it into a Roth, you may decide to just take it out and pay the penalty. Remember, the tax you're going to pay anyway. So it's only the 10% penalty and only if you're under 59 and a half. So if you're an old guy like me, no penalty, just take it out. Um, you're going to have to pay that tax down the road anyway. Why not pay it? It it's, doesn't make a difference whether you pay it now or not, frankly. Uh, so just know that if it's an IRA now, interestingly enough, there's nothing in here about 401ks, which means that could you have a solo 401k and invest in the syndication? And based on the current proposal, the answer would be yes, you could. So the other option that you have between now and the end of the year is you might want to take your IRA and form a solo 401k and roll your IRA into the 401k if you're allowed to do that. Now you have to look at all the rules and everything not positive you can do it, but I think you can. So um, that's something to be asking your tax advisor about. Um, I'm giving you 
generalities here. Just know that, that every once in a while I'm wrong about something. This is one that I didn't do the research on, but I would want to look at, could I take my IRA? If I wanted to continue, if I had IRA investments and syndications, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna require it to be distributed or are they going to grandfather those in? I would hope they would grandfather them in, meaning that they're not gonna require you to take them out if, you're, if it's already in there, but what they will do is not allow you to invest in the future. We don't know, again, the devil is in the details, right? And we don't know what's gonna happen there. Um, so stay tuned on that. We will, by the way, once the law passes, uh, we will do an out, another town hall. Uh, we will give you all of the updated scoop on what actually passes, and we'll give you some planning ideas for it. I'm giving you this now because I think by the time it passes, it's gonna to be too late to do some of this planning. So I want you to get started talk to your attorney, talk to your CPA, um, talk to your wealth ability advisor, and make sure that, that you're on board doing this. Let's talk about this next one, qualified business income deduction. Now, if you're an S corporation or a partnership, you know that you're getting a 20% haircut, which is a good haircut, right? So you're only paying tax on 80% of your income right now. Under this proposal, that would be limited to 500,000. Now, I want to be really clear. It's not limited to $500,000 of income. It's limited to $500,000 of deduction. So what does that mean? That if you have income under, if your net income is under 2.5 million, you're not going to get hurt with this. It's only for those of you have net income over 2.5 million who are going to lose some of this deduction. We have clients that are in there. So just remember that, that it's, it's a $500,000 deduction limit. It's not a $500,000 income limit. Next to the last one, loss limitation. This is rarely, I, I've rarely seen this happen. I do have a client that this uh, uh, happens with, and that is that they have enough non-business income. And non-business income includes um, uh, interest, dividends, uh, could include um, distributions from retirement plans. Um, there, it's it's non-business income. Uh, that can only be offset by up to five hundred thousand dollars of business losses, which includes real estate losses. Now, all of your wages, your um, business income, your uh, real estate income, all of those can be offset, right, without limit. It's just a non-business income. Now, that doesn't mean. We're not talking about passive loss rules or anything like that. That's not changing. What I'm saying is that if you have those losses and you would otherwise be able to take them, now they could be limited. We've had that limitation, um, but it, it, it's, um, this, this would actually make that limitation permanent is what this would do, this bill. Last but not least, the IRS. This is actually a big one. So, the IRS budget right now is about $13 billion. Uh, this uh, bill would basically double the size of the IRS. Here's what's interesting. So it would give $80 billion to the IRS over a number of years, $80 billion. With the stipulation that it's gonna be, it's supposed to be used for two things. One is technology and the other is for audits. There is, Nothing in there that says it's supposed to be used for customer service. And just to give you an idea, um, right now, the IRS is answering 2% of phone calls. So you literally have a 2% chance of getting your phone call answered when you call the IRS. None of this money is targeted towards customer service. Now, will they be able to use it that way? Maybe, but that's not where it's targeted. Second thing, in the bill, it actually says, that the audits, the increased audits are not supposed to apply. So all these additional auditors they hire are not supposed to go after anybody under $400,000. So what does that mean? That means we keep, our target is $400,000. That's what it means. So our clients, my goal with, with, my, with the clients I work with directly and the goal of all uh, our wealth ability advisors is to keep our clients' taxable income below 400,000. If that's the case, I think you're gonna be very unlikely to be audited. 
Now let's talk about the fun stuff. Incentives, because these are huge. And then we're gonna go to uh, question and answer. Energy, the big one. The big one is energy incentives and particularly renewable energy. This includes not only um, solar panels, but it also includes wind. It also includes hydrogen, okay? Which is really interesting because we've had hydrogen um, technology for many, many years. I actually, years ago, I was talking to this guy at a, at a seminar and he said he had a hydrogen powered car that got the eff effectively 98 miles to the gallon. And this was years ago. This was maybe at least 10 years ago. So we've had that technology. Now it's being encouraged. So I actually like I like these incentives. So let me tell you about the primary incentive. Primary incentive is going to be a tax credit of 30% for solar panels. Well, we've had that credit, right? It's just gone down the last couple of years. Uh, 2020, it went down to um, 18, uh, 28% and 2020 uh, and 2021, it went down to 26%. But at the end of this year, it's scheduled to go down to 10%. This would actually uh, move it back up to 30% and make it that way um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I believe it's a five-year provision, but I think that's I, I, my personal opinion. I think it's a good thing, okay? But here's what it means. Let's, you can get the 30% credit on your home. But what if you put it on your business or your rental real estate? Well, now not only do you get the 30% credit, but you also get a deduction. We currently have what's called bonus depreciation. And bonus depreciation is basically 100% of the cost of equipment. Well, so does that mean we get 100, if we put in $100,000 in solar panels, would we get a $100,000 deduction? The answer is no. We get an $85,000 deduction and a $30,000 credit. But what that means is when you combine those two together, that's 64% if you're in a 40% tax bracket, 64%. That's not counting any state tax benefits, which means you're only putting down 36% or roughly a third. So you're getting all of the benefit from the reduced power consumption, but only having to put in 36% of the cost. So I think that is a huge one. I, I think that's gonna be a major um, shift in incentives and where people put their money. Um, so just keep that in mind. Another one, housing. The low income housing credit is going up and it's being made easier. So if you do low income housing or you consider low income housing, that is a positive development for you. Children, we don't typically think of, of children as being incentivized, but in this case, they are. So this is a big topic right now that's a big part of the negotiation is if we keep this increased child tax credit, which is up as much as $3,600 per child under the age of six and $3,000 per child over the age uh, six or older, if, if they, it's, and they're, they're looking at extending that. Now, right now they're talking about one year, um, they want five years, We'll see, that, that's a negotiating point right now. Um, but what that means is that is an incentive to have more children. I, I don't know how else you look at it. Uh, that's how I look at it. So you do have not just the, not just an, the child tax credit, but also the dependent uh, care credit. So in other words, um, the, the, the credit that you get for hiring a babysitter or uh, sending your uh, child to preschool um, would be, uh, keep that increased rate that we have right now, which is 8,000 for one child and 16,000 for two children. Um, so that incentive is there. Research and development. This is a big one that I think is very positive. Uh, the research and development credit at, is, is scheduled to uh, go into um, being amortized. Uh, research and development is going to be amortized over the next five, over five years. Instead of you getting the deduction research and development. Um, I've always thought that was a bad idea. I think you should be able to deduct it. And because I, I, I'm a big fan of research and development. This bill would, um, would, would make it deductible again. So it'd make it uh, immediately deductible like it has been um, for the past many years. 
Last one I want to talk about is rehabilitation credit. This is for uh, rehabbing uh, historic housing, for example. Um, that credit is actually going up as high as 30%. So um, I know I've uh, I had a client in the past that did a lot of uh, historic rehab. Um, they're going to be very happy about this credit because it was 20%. Um, for smaller projects, it's going to go up. It, it's uh, expected to go up to 30%. So there are some serious tax benefits here, so don't ignore that. But there's also some changes. I think when we look at the tax rates and some of the hidden increases, we may shift some of our planning. So for those of you who work with WealthAbility, you know that we do a long-term tax strategy, right? So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to sit down between now and the end of the year, and we're going to want to shift our tax planning somewhat and make sure that we're following um, using the new law and staying under that $400,000 threshold, okay? So um, Manny, I think I'm going to, or uh, Deanna, I think I'm going to stop there and let people, uh, we're at uh, 45 minutes, which was right on target, mm -hmm. and we have some questions. Yeah, let's, let's start with Ron. He has a live question. Uh, I'm about to talk, here we go. Ron. Just unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Ron. Ron. Okay, well, while Ron is figuring that out, let's see. Let's go to a question that we have in the question and answer box. Um, Rich asks, curious if you think the proposal to not allow IRAs to invest in qualified accredited investor deals will be part of the bill that passes. If so, will it stay two years to get out of them or to avoid, will it take two years to get out of them to avoid losing IRA uh, account treatment? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, as I brought that up uh, previously, that's one of the hidden <clears throat> that's one of the hidden tax increases, which is is right here under qualified plans. Uh, I think it will be in the bill, and I'll tell you why I think it's going to be in the bill. I think it is because this is a Wall Street provision. This is an encouragement. Uh, remember, I talked about corporate tax rates having a negative impact on stock prices, this would have a positive impact on stock prices because I think most people would not take that money and take it out. I think what they do is they reinvest it into the stock market, which I think, I think that's the reason behind this proposal is that they want this money to go into the stock market instead of going into syndication. It is the only reason I can think of for this provision. So I do think, I think there's a very high chance I just don't think there's anybody lobbying against it hard enough that I can tell. I know the real estate lobby probably is lobbying against it. I don't know how strong they're lobbying against it. They, they, they're getting some benefits in the carried interest rule. They still have their benefits in the uh, bonus depreciation. I think they're a little hesitant to go after this um, provision. Uh, I, what will happen? I don't know. I, I'm hopeful that they just grandfather them. And they say, look, we're going to let them play out. We're going to, you know, once they sell, then you can't reinvest, right? But those that are already in there, you won't have to divest of those. It would be really expensive to divest of those. Um, in fact, I would tell you that the better answer than divesting of them is going to be to actually distribute out um, the, the asset. Okay, so take a distribution because remember the value of that, let's say you invested in a syndication two years ago. The value of, this, of the limited partnership interest is not what you paid for. It's considerably less. So even though you may have paid $100,000, it may be only, the value may be only $40,000 or $50,000. So I don't think it's gonna be as big a hit as you think it is um, because I think the valuation now, <laughs> Here's gonna be the fun part, valuing it, right? Valuation, business valuation appraisers are just gonna go nuts over this. They're gonna love this. This is full, full employment act for business valuation um, analysts. So um, <laughs> that's something that we're gonna look at. I'm hopeful that the, the wise thing to do would be to just let them play out as opposed to make you distribute them. But we'll see, we'll see. Who's next, Manny? 
Sure. And just a reminder, if you want to participate tonight, all you need to do is raise your hand. The next question comes from Richard. He says, or he asks, can you use a solo 401k for syndication now instead of the IRA if the rule goes into effect? And, and the answer there is yes. There is nothing in the spell that would prohibit that. So th that that's why I say that's, that's the other alternative. Again, I'm not a big fan of that. Remember that some of you have seen, seen this, but remember when we were in grade school and we learned that negative one times negative one equals positive one. Well, that's what happens. And you think about this, if you take real estate, which is a tax shelter investment, and you put it into an IRA, which is another tax shelter investment, you end up with a tax bill, right? Because you're taking something that's non-taxable and you're actually making it taxable. So I'm not a huge fan of this in, in the first place. Many of you know that, um, but could you do it in a solo form of K? The answer is presumably yes, because there's nothing in the bill to prevent you. Who's next, Manny? All right, Tom. Uh, next one, it comes from uh, Greg. He says, the proposed IRA rule changes could an IRA still invest in a 506B syndication that allows not non-accredited investors? Yes. So there are some uh, syndications that allow non-accredited investors. Some of them may just allow a limited number of non-accredited, just um, a Reg D offering typically allows up to 35 um, non-accredited investors. So could they allow non-accredited Credit investors, they could. Most syndications don't do that just because it puts a burden on them and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big liability for them because the idea behind the syndication, uh, behind the accredited investor is rule, is that you, not that you know more, but that you can absorb the loss. So if they start taking non-accredited investors, those people can't always afford the loss. And if, and if you lose money and if this, the developer loses money, they could get a lawsuit. And if they have 35 of those, they could get a big lawsuit. So while yes, the answer is technically under the law, um, if you are not required to be accredited in order to invest, you could. I'll give you another one, a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. You absolutely could. Again, I'm gonna tell you again, this is a bad idea, folks. Why would you turn a non-taxable event, real estate, into a taxable event? It's interesting, we've gotten three of these questions right in a row. I'm gonna reiterate, I, I do not like it. I don't like it. And the reason people do it is because of misunderstanding how the tax law works and misunderstanding what's possible. Um, so I would, I would, into, I, I would suggest you sit down with your tax advisor and if your tax advisor says, you know what, you're not gonna get those losses anyway because you're gonna be passive losses. I would suggest you ought to talk to a different tax advisor. Maybe shop around a little bit. In chapter 23 of, of Tax Free Wealth, I, I talk about how to find the right tax advisor or you can always press the easy button and just call Wealth Ability. So um, I, would, I would seriously question, I, uh, I've got a serious question. Why would you do that? Who's next, Manny? Hi, Tom. It's Deanna. I will go ahead and take over the Q and A section. Great. Our yeah. next question. Our next question here is: Should we keep our primary residence and two rental properties in a trust for tax purposes? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Now, primary residence probably not. Okay. And the reason you don't put a primary residence in a and now. Okay. Let me let me back up. There are two types of trusts. So we're getting a little more detailed here, but it's okay because this is part of the planning we're talking about um, because of the estate tax change. You have two types of trusts. You have revocable and you have irrevocable. In my opinion, 
Anybody with any assets at all should have a revocable trust. And the reason for that is that it makes it so much easier when you die on the people you leave behind um, because the title of your assets have already changed. So should your home be in a revocable trust? Absolutely. Do you wanna put your home in an irrevocable trust? Probably not. Here's the difference. So in a revocable trust, it's not a taxable entity. It, in fact, it's invisible to the IRS. So what that means is you still get your $250,000 or $500,000 exclusion when you sell your home. You wanna retain that exclusion. That's a very big tax benefit, especially with um, tax rates as high as 31.8%, right? Um, capital gains tax rates plus state taxes. So literally you could have a 40% tax that $500,000 exemption could be worth $200,000 to you, anywhere from $100,000 to $200,000 to you. So you don't want to lose that, ex that exemption, that $500,000 exemption, married, finally joint, $250,000 single. So we do, we want that in a revocable trust. Your other assets, you may consider an irrevocable trust. Now, let me tell you one of the um, hidden tax increases. Um, in this proposal, which unless the estate planners really get their um, lobbying together, could go through. And this one is, is this. Let's say you put money into an irrevocable, which means you cannot revoke that trust. That, what that means is that trust is permanent. It doesn't mean it can't be changed, it just means it's permanent. So you can't undo it. So, an irrevocable trust is really good for estate planning. So typically what you'll do is you, you put, if you put your assets into an irrevocable trust, they're out of your estate. They're in the estate of the beneficiary of the trust. They're not in your estate. You've gotten them out of your estate. This is the type of planning we're currently doing for all of our clients between now and the end of the year because we think that estate tax exclusion is coming down. We're looking at irrevocable trust for everybody. I have an irrevocable, I have an irrevocable trust um, most of my clients either have one now or we're working on it. Um, and the, the, again, that's the state plan. Historically, what you've been able to do though is even though the trust is irrevocable and the, the tax, the income tax on the assets, let's say you've got real estate or business or whatever, the income tax could be paid by the person who put the money in, the grantor or the settler, um, could be paying those income taxes. Under this bill, if you pay the income taxes on the trust, in other words, what's called a grantor trust, if you pay the income taxes, it will be included in your estate. So we'll see if that changes, but that's actually a very major rule change for estate planning purposes. I mean, a really big, big, big uh, rule change for estate planning purposes. So um, you, you're gonna wanna look at that issue. Your, your rental real estate, can go in an irrevocable trust. Um, your other assets should, at a minimum, should be in a revocable trust. Who's next, Diana? Thank you, Tom. Our next question is from John. The proposed house tax plan had a retroactive limitation on the conservation easement deduction. Is it constitutional to have retroactive limitations on deductions? Well, that's the question. So let's explain, let me explain what that is. Um, for those of you who don't know, a conservation easement, uh, remember what an easement is. An easement is a right of way. And a conservation easement gives a right of way to a conservation charity where they have a permanent right of way um, to use that property and you don't have the right to use that property for any kind of development purposes. So Usually what happens is, let's say you've got a piece of uh, a ranch in Wyoming, and that ranch, you could develop it. If you developed it, it'd be worth $10 million. But if you couldn't develop it, it's only worth $2 million. Well, the difference between that $10 million and that $2 million, that's the value of that conservation easement. So let's say you put that conservation easement on that ranch. Well, then what happens? Well, you get a deduction of $8 million. So here's the proposal. The proposal is, now, some people do it on their own property, but some people 
put, put their property into a partnership and they basically sell the tax benefits to people who can use them. Let's say you're a farmer or you're a rancher, you, can't, you, you don't have that much tax. So basically what you do is you let other people come in and they get the tax benefit of the conservation easement. So it's that situation. It's not where you put on your own conservation easement. It's where you're in a partnership that does a conservation easement that is being addressed here in this um, proposed legislation. And what the legislation says, so this is true, this is in the bill right now. Hopefully it won't be. If you had a conservation easement, anytime after December 23rd of 2016, you would get a retroactive tax disallowing a good portion of that deduction, say about 50% of that deduction or more, and a 40% penalty. So I actually think you have two different questions on constitutionality. One is, is the retroactive position, uh, is the retroactive provision constitutional? The second is, is the penalty, the retroactive penalty provision constitutional? So I think it's easier to argue that the retroactive tax is constitutional because it's just a tax that you would have paid if they enacted it in the first place. But the penalty provision, you're penalizing somebody for something they couldn't possibly have anticipated. Now, the reason they did that time frame is because the IRS released a notice at that time, that's the date. They released this notice saying, we don't think you should get more than two and a half times your investment as a deduction. Okay, now look at that number. If your tax rate is 40%, what's two and a half times the investment? It's 100%. So basically, we don't think you should get a tax benefit in excess of your investment. As it is, uh, most conservation easements produce a 40 to 50% return on investment. So in other words, instead of getting a uh, $100,000 tax benefit on $100,000 investment, you get $150,000 to $200,000 tax benefit on $100,000 investment. So this is a retroactive provision. Um, is it constitutional? I've done some research on this, and it appears that the retroactive tax is constitutional. I have not seen anybody write about the retroactive penalty um, being constitutional and unconstitutional, but it will go into court. It will be in court. Who's next, Deanna? Thank you, Tom. Our next question is from Michael. Would something like early stage investing, angel investing from an Roth IRA be disallowed under the new changes? If it required an accredited investor, yes. Yeah, if, if, if you were required to be accredited in order to do it, yes. If you're not required to be accredited, no. So the, that's the law. The law is accredited, okay? It's not private investments, not private equity. It's specifically, if you would, were required to be accredited, you would not be able to invest through an IRA. Let's go to the next one, Deanna. Thank you. Our next question is from Robert. What will happen with the step up on basis? Any ideas? Yes, thank you. That's dead. Good news. Uh, that, that, that proposal is dead. That is not going to happen. So here was the proposal. Typically, let's say that you have, um, you die and your business is worth $10 million. Right? So this is your business or your farm is worth $10 million. Remember, we've got an estate tax exclusion of more than $10 million. And let's say that's your only asset. So you would pay your estate tax. This is current law. It would be zero. Here's what else happens though. Let's say that you only paid a million dollars for this business. If it's your business, you may have paid zero, right? Because you may have deducted all the costs. So let's say that you have a million dollars. If 
you, you paid a million dollars for it. That means that your gain, if you sold this property during your lifetime, your gain would be $9 million. This is the gain. Under current law, when you die, that gain disappears. Completely disappears. And in fact, you would get to redepreciate, or your kids would get to, or your heirs would get to redepreciate the property. So the proposal was that you would not get that $9 million step up in basis, and there would be tax actually when you died, capital gains tax in addition to any estate tax. Well, in this case, estate tax would be zero, but capital gains tax would be, again, as much as 40% between federal and state. So this, this provision is coming out of the bill. It's very clear. It's not going to be in, in it wasn't in the Ways and Means Bill. It, it, I, I'm sorry, it's, not, it, it's just, it's dead, okay? Um, it's dead. I can't remember if it's in the Ways and Means Bill. I don't think it is, um, but it's completely dead. Uh, they, 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 there's too many farming and ranching senators and they just said, and, and Congress people, and they just said no. So I, I'm not, we're not concerned about this one anymore. Who's next, Jana? Up next, our question is from John. How is the IRS realistically going to use the info on the proposed 10K reporting requirement for bank accounts? Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Here's a hidden tax we can talk about. <laughs> oh my heavens. So thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Here's the, here's the proposal. If you have $10,000 going through your bank account during the year, this means everybody. This is everybody except for, um, pretty much undocumented aliens who don't have bank accounts, uh, has $10,000 going through their account, right? I mean, if you've got $1,000 of rent a month, that's $12,000. So you've got $10,000. Um, they start, they were at $600. They said, oh, we're going we're gonna to make this way better. It's only 10, it's going to be $10,000. Well, everybody has $10,000. Everybody has $10,000 going through their bank account. Um, if you're Depositing your check. Now, they've talked about exempting um, direct deposit wages. Right? Come on. So here's the proposal. The proposal is that the banks would be required to report all bank transactions. To the IRS. All of them. We have no idea. They think that will raise six hundred billion dollars. I don't know how it raises anything. Uh, the community banks are going crazy over this one. I got to tell you, it's an enormous invasion of privacy. Here's what they could do. Let me tell you what they could do. And I have to warn you: um, you may not sleep tonight. So you may want to not watch this part, okay? Because let me tell you what they could do. Particularly for business accounts. We right now have a couple of schedules. We have one called an M1 schedule. We have an M2 schedule. And we have an M3 schedule. And these schedules are to reconcile book, versus tax. In other words, what's our book income? What are recorded in our accounting versus our tax income? Let me tell you what's possible here. And this literally, I lose sleep at night. M4. And M4 would be bank versus tax. If I were the IRS, this is what I would do. 
And I got to tell you, our commissioner, Chuck Reddick of the IRS, is a former tax professional. So he was a tax lawyer before he became a commissioner of the IRS. He's smart. He's a pretty smart guy. If I were the IRS, this is what I would do. I'd actually require a reconciliation on business tax returns of what the bank has reported to my tax return. Let me give you an example though, of just how onerous this is. There are many companies that every night the bank sweeps the account, it takes it out of one account and puts it and, and actually does an overnight short-term loan and puts it into another account or on a regular basis, maybe once a week, once a month. It sweeps the account once it gets to a certain level and puts it into an interest-bearing account. You'd have to reconcile that. What about all the transfers you have between accounts? I have 26 bank accounts, at least. I have more than that. I'm transferring money all the time. All of those would have to be reconciled. So we don't know what they're going to do with the information. If they're just going to report gross information, I, I don't know. But if I were the IRS, this is what I would do. If you really wanted to raise revenue from it, this is what you would do. So again, it, this is not in the proposal. This would be something that the IRS would come out with in a form, um, but that's what I would do. Now, what, now what's interesting is that they're applying this not just to um, business accounts, this is being applied to personal accounts as well. Uh, so what do they do with personal accounts? I don't know. I, I think for personal accounts, it's like meaningless. Um, it's interesting though, it, it may be an argument, that maybe the first ar good argument I've ever heard for a Schedule C, if they don't apply the M4 schedule, something like that to a personal account is, Let's take my business income and my personal account. Therefore, it won't get reported to the IRS. I don't know. Um, I think this is a very onerous provision. I hope that saner minds prevail because I think that I, I personally believe this is just a, a terrible idea. Just a terrible idea. Um, I don't want, I, I, it's a very, very big rule of mine. Don't tell the IRS more than you have to. That's rule number one with the IRS. Well, rule number one is, you never talk to the IRS, that's my job. Rule number two is, um, you don't give the IRS any information that you don't have to give them. Okay, that's rule number two. Rule number one is only your tax advisor talks to the IRS. Rule number two, you don't give them any information that they don't specifically ask for and that they're not, they're not able to get on their own. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, very important um, proposal. It is being proposed. It's not in the legislation out of Ways and Means Committee, but that doesn't mean it won't get into the final bill. It's, it keep, they, they keep talking about it. So the more they talk about it, the more likely it is to get in. Uh, hopefully, again, Sater Mice will prevail. Um, who's, uh, let's take one more, and then I'm gonna take a, a, a just briefly go through the, um, the process for the bill. Uh, so let's go ahead and take one more question before I do that, Diana. Okay. Our next question is from John. Is the SALT, S-A-L-T, deduction coming back without the AMT? Oh, my heavens. John, you were like all over it. SALT. State. And. Local. Tax. Salt. That's the salt reduction. So what happened is, is in 2017, there was a permanent elimination um, of any deduction for state and local taxes, including real estate taxes, over $10,000 per person. Um, it actually made the 2017 Tax Act the most progressive meaning that the higher income paid way more, um, got much less of a tax benefit. In fact, the higher income people got no tax benefit. They actually got a tax increase. There was a fallacy 
in thinking that if we go to a from 39.6 to 37 percent, that's a tax break for the rich. It was not because of the state and local tax deduction. Remember, let's say that you've got a 10% state tax rate and you're in a and you're in a 40% tax bracket. That deduction is worth four four thousand dollars to you, four or four percent, right? It's worth four percent. It's like a four percent tax reduction to you. Well, if you only had a 2.6% overall deduction, but you had a 4% tax increase, you had a net increase of 1.4%. If we reverse that, the opposite is true. So when you hear this tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich, basically it's let's tax the rich in every, every place where um, there's not a high state income tax, right? So, um, the state and local tax deduction only benefits the rich. Now, John brought up a really important point. In 2017, the other thing that we lost was the alternative minimum tax. And the reason we lost it is because without the state and local tax deduction, there was no need for it. So here's how that worked. Basically, state and local taxes were never deductible for alternative minimum tax purposes. Now, if the Democrats really wanted to raise taxes on the wealthy, they, and they wanted to raise revenue, they would just reinstate the alternative minimum tax. Uh, reinstating the alternative minimum tax is, is projected, even without the SALT deduction, to raise over $600 billion. So, um, I don't know if they're gonna bring this back. I don't know how they're ever gonna pass it. They're, they're, it's, they're squeezing the income anyway. Uh, I don't know what they're gonna do about it because there are some of the progressives uh, Democrats that say we won't vote for this bill without this deduction reinstated. I don't think they're very progressive if they want to reinstate this. This, this elimination of this tax benefit was actually, a, a, from a policy standpoint, a really good change because there's no theoretical basis for it, okay, um, to give a state and local tax deduction. So thanks for bringing this up. Um, it is on the table still. Who knows? I, I, I just can't imagine that. And if they do bring it back, maybe they bring it back with the AMT. Maybe that's what they do. Maybe that's how they pay for it. Um, that's very possible, okay? Um, but I have not heard any talk about AMT. I've heard a lot of talk about state and local tax. If they brought the state and local tax deduction back without the AMT, the rich, the, the wealthy people would get a net tax reduction in this bill. Keep that in mind. Now, let's talk real quickly about um, how this bill will proceed. There is still a negotiation. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, um, the Speaker of the House, has said that she wants this bill to pass out of the House by the end of next week, October 31st, um, Halloween. And they are pushing for that. They're really pushing hard. Uh, in order to do that, though, they want to have negotiated with the Senate ahead of time. So not only do they get, have to get their own, they, they can only lose three votes in the House, right? They lose four votes, they're done. So they're, we always talk about the Senate because Senate's even, but the House is almost as even. It's just a little, I think it's a little easier for Nancy Pelosi to strong arm. Um, the, the House members than it is for Chuck Schumer to strong on the senators. Once it, so the next thing that has to happen is they need to pass the bill in the House. Once they do that, they send it to the Senate. The Senate then comes up with their own version. The Senate passes out their version of the bill. Then they sit down and they negotiate between the Senate and the House. That's called the Joint Committee on Taxation. And the Joint Committee on Taxation is a few members of the House Ways and Means Committee and a few members of the Senate Finance Committee. Remember, um, uh, the Democrats are in control of both the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means. So you're gonna get 
more Democrats than you are Republicans, you still are gonna have some Republicans on those committees. Even though the Republicans are, have been adamant that not one of the Republican senators is voting for it, none of the Republican members of the House is voting for it, um, you're still gonna get some Republicans on that committee. Uh, so that'll be interesting. That's the Joint Committee on Taxation. What comes out of the Joint Committee is a reconciled bill. In other words, they take the House bill, they take the Senate bill, they come up with their what they're, they're comfortable with, then they have to send it back to the House and the Senate, and the House and the Senate have to repass the bill. So they're passing the reconciled bill. That's when it goes to President Biden to be signed, not until it passes the second time through the House and the Senate. So what's the timing on that? Well, I don't know if you, you've heard, but Chuck Schumer, uh, the President of the Senate has said, uh, I'm sorry, not President of the Senate, that would be Kamala Harris, but um, the House, the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer has said, um, we're going to pass this this week. From a timing standpoint, they probably need to do that. Um, at least pass it in the House this week or negotiate it this week, because it takes time. Now you have to send it back to the House and they have to agree to it. Now Nancy Pelosi has to make sure her people are all together and they vote on it. Now you have to get back to the Senate. You have to make sure that Kirsten Sinema and, Chuck, uh, and uh, um, um, Joe Manchin are on board, as well as Mark Kelly and the other, you know, some of the other moderate Democrats, uh, senators. You need to make sure they're on board. Once you do that, then you pass that out each of those out. You pass the, those separate bills, but now you have to get together in joint committee. So my guess is earliest would be mid-November that it passes. Um, it could be as late as mid-December before it passes. Um, that's what happened with the 2017 Tax Act. We all, you know, the, the Republicans had um, true control of the House and the Senate and, and the presidency, um, not this bare minimum control that the, that the um, uh, they had a little bit more leeway in the House and the Senate. The Republicans did in 2017 than the Democrats do in 2021. So um, it, it will take a little bit of time. It's not done yet. Even once you see that bill come out, it's not done yet. On top of that, they have to write all the language. So all the attorneys and accountants have to get together um, on the staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation. They need to write the bill. So I know they're writing it already. Um, don't believe they're not working already on this. They're already doing that. The idea is that they will only have to just make changes to it, right? So that's basically how it works. And I think we've got time for a couple more questions, Deanna. Okay, thank you, Tom. Our next question is from David. Does the Opportunity Zone program remain unchanged? It does, it does. That, that, is, that, is, not, that, I, that is not on the chopping blocks at all. In fact, it may be extended. Um, I think there's, I'm trying to remember um, if it's actually in the bill that passed out of Ways and Means, but there's been some talk about extending it. And I do believe there are some similar provisions um, that maybe not specifically qualified opportunity zones, but similar provisions in, um, in the bill that would give additional tax benefits. They're looking at certain areas that might need um, maybe some expansion to that qual those qualified opportunity zones. I, I don't see it going away. I, I think this is, is there. I think both sides like it, um, frankly. And I actually, I like it. I think it's a really good idea because what you're doing is that the incentive there is to redevelop marginal areas and uh, bring them on board faster by giving a tax incentive. So uh, it's actually, I think, really good policy if you like incentives as part of tax policy. Who's next, Yana? Uh, next, our question is from Errol. Is the housing credit for renting or building low-income housing? It is for building low-income housing. It's for building. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up next, our question is from Gary. Do you recommend rolling over 401k even for high tax bracket families? Uh, into a Roth. Um, you may want to do that. It depends on, it all depends on your investment strategy. What we, what we always say is we don't want the 
tax tail to wag the investment dog. So you have to look at what are, what are you investing in and what's your timeline for investing, right? Because if your timeline's long, it may not make sense um, to roll it over because you're gonna have a long time. Remember, you're getting compounding on a higher number. The idea behind an IRA is that you compound a higher number. And it, the longer you're going to compound that, the better off you are to leave it in that IRA rather than take the haircut on the tax. Um, so in other words, let's say you have $100,000 and you're in a 40% tax bracket. Well, the question is, you can have $100,000 in a regular IRA. Versus $60,000 in a Roth. Okay, so let's say this is a Roth and this is a uh, regular. So the question is if I'm compounding, do I want to compound? Let's say I'm getting 5% every year. Do I want 5% of 60 or do I want 5% of 100? Now, in the end, you're still going to pay tax here on the total. So this goes from 100,000 to a million. Now you're going to pay a tax on a million. But again, it depends also on are you going to retire rich or poor? Because if you plan to retire poor, you're way better off with the regular. Way better because your tax bracket's lower. If you're going to retire rich, you may be better off with the Roth because you want to take that out. At, do you want to pay tax on the tree or do you want to pay tax on the seed? That's really the question here, right? I'm not a big fan of IRAs in the first place, but I'm a bigger fan of Roths. However, when you run the numbers, you always have to run the numbers. So never forget to sit down with your CPA, your Wealth Ability Advisor, and run the numbers. Um, and that's really your answer. Run the numbers. And then also, what are you going to invest in? See, if I'm investing in the stock market, I may be fine in the IRA. Um, if I'm investing in, um, if, if I'm investing someplace else, I may want to invest through a Roth. So again, run the numbers, sit down with your CPA, run the numbers. And that's going, the numbers are going to tell you the answer to that question. And then also look at what are you investing in, right? If you're investing in uh, um, something that's, you know, only going to earn a marginal amount, you, you may, you know, again, that may be different than if you're investing in something that has a high return. So again, run the numbers. All right. Uh, at least one more here. Let's, okay. let's keep going. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Our next question is from Ron. Will any of the energy incentives be available to offset taxes for this year? Uh, the new incentives won't. However, there are already energy incentives. So we currently have a 26% solar tax credit. So the only difference between this year and next year is going to be 4%. We, we're, the, the proposal takes it from 26% to 30%. But other than that, you already have that incentive. So um, they are available this year. By the way, one other um, incentive I didn't talk about was charging stations. Uh, there, the, there, is, there are credits for charging stations and there have been historically very small caps on the amount of the credit that you can get. Those caps are coming off and you're gonna be able to get much bigger credit um, or a credit from many more charging stations. So uh, just consider that when you're looking at, do I want to put charging stations, for, for example, in my, um, let's say you've got class A uh, rental, maybe you want to put some charging stations in. Or let's say you've got a convenience store, maybe you want to put some charging stations in. Uh, there are some major tax credits there in the bill that are, that are very um, significantly capped right now. So the answer is yes, there are some incentives right now. Um, there's no reason to wait. Frankly, there's no reason to wait um, when you're talking about the solar and wind energy credits. 
Uh, let's keep going. Who's next? Okay, we do have quite a few questions, Tom, in regards to the 1031 exchange. Will it still oh. be available? And are the tax change proposals for the 1031 exchange rule? What are the tax proposals? There are none. 1031 is safe. We're not going to have a t change in 1031 um, in the 1031 exchange. That 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 safe bonus depreciation is not on the chopping blocks either. So we're good. Uh, you got another one there, Deanna? Um, I have a question from Anna. If I just have a trading which has a little profit, do I need to include it in my tax this year? Uh, say that one more time. If I just have a trading which has a little profit. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, let me bring up one more thing here, um, be, and we're going to uh, conclude. Uh, and that is cryptocurrency. <laughs> Okay, so that hasn't come up. I'm surprised it hasn't come up. It's not in this bill, but it's in the companion bill, which is the infrastructure bill. And in that bill, um, if you uh, regularly exchange cryptocurrency, you're required to report it. Um, what that means is it's like, it's intended for Coinbase, for example, um, you know, the, the, the big exchanges. They're, you're, they're going to report like a stockbroker, like a um, um, TD Ameritrade would have to report, right? They're going to report like that, and they're going to report your basis, and they're going to report your sales, they're going to report your gains and losses. One of the things that's in, the, that, uh, in this bill regarding crypto, so that's in the infrastructure bill, the reporting, but what's in this bill is um, right now, there's no wash sale rules for cryptocurrency. Now, this is a huge planning idea. A um, little late to take care of it because crypto is at all-time highs right now. Uh, but if you sell your cryptocurrency at a loss, let's say you buy it right now for Bitcoin for 70000 and let's say it dips to 50000 Well, you could sell it at $50,000, take the loss, and buy it back the same day under the current law. Well, that's called a wash sale. And under the proposed legislation, you would not be able to do that. You'd have to wait 30 days like you do for stocks. Um, so you, you're very much at risk if you sell um, at a loss because it might go right back up, uh, which happens a lot in the stock market. People sell at the end of December and the stock market dips at the end of December um, when they sell because there's so many people selling to, to get their tax losses. And then when they buy it back in January, 30 days later, the stock market's gone back up and they lose money. I'm never a fan of selling stocks in December. I always think that's a bad idea. Um, so that's a change in the cryptocurrency law um, where you will not be able to do that under this bill. And I think that will go through. Okay, that's a good policy change. It makes sense that Cryptocurrency would not have a benefit that stocks don't have. So I, I, I actually think that's probably, that's fair. Um, a couple of other things we're not gonna see. We're not gonna see a wealth tax. We're not gonna see, I don't think we're gonna see it even on billionaires, okay? Um, could we have, so one of the proposals has been that um, at a certain level, if you have unrealized gains, meaning you haven't sold the stock yet, you're gonna be taxed. There's a proposal to tax that as if you'd sold it at the end of the year. There's a lot of issues and challenges with it that make it really difficult to administer. If you did it in a very limited fashion, you could probably do it. And that is if it only applied to public stocks and you were allowed to take losses that you had previously recognized as income. So th there had to be very strict rules on it for them to do it. They, there is a provision in the current law that's called a mark to market rule. Uh, it's an elective provision. This would be a non-elective provision and would presumably only apply at certain levels, um, but it's being proposed right now. And I think it's on the block. I, I think it's a possibility because again, you've got a Kirsten Sinema says, I don't want rates to raise. Well, if you don't have rates raised, how are you gonna raise the money? Well, you could all do alternative tax. You could do a mark to market. And then you would really go after the billionaires 
how to mark to market. Then you go after uh, Bill Gates, and then you go after Elon Musk, and you go after um, Jeff Bezos and, and Warren Buffett. That would be le a legitimate tax on billionaires. The way it is right now, this tax, again, this tax increase is primarily on upper middle income and, and more so business owners than employees. Employees already have the 3%, 0.8% net investment income tax on their wages, um, but business owners have not. Um, and again, business owners could have been limited on their qualified business income deduction. So there are some major things there. Um, we're gonna wrap it up here. I wanna thank everybody. This has been absolutely fantastic. Your questions are amazing. Um, uh, join us. Uh, our, we do a, a webinar twice a month called WealthAbility Live, and it is available to anybody who's a client of WealthAbility, and we would love to have you join us and um, allow us to help you reduce your tax because your taxes, because here's what happens. First of all, remember, if you're going to change it, if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts. And when we're talking about this bill, that's a very important part because we can change our facts. Instead of investing, for example, in oil and gas, we might switch to clean energy. That's what the government wants you to do. They're saying, we don't want you to invest in oil and gas, we want you to invest in solar and wind and uh, hydrogen. So could you do that? Yes, change your tax by changing your facts. Second thing to remember is, it's really much about the education. The more you understand about the tax law, and your questions have been absolutely amazing, thank you. The more you understand about tax law, um, the more money you make, because here's what happens. And you all wanna write this down. And this is true under this tax, this proposal, as it is under current law. The more income you make, the more taxes you pay. The more assets you build, the less taxes you pay. And that is gonna to continue to be true. That is a, basically a fundamental principle of every um, established government in the world, every first world government in the world, that the more assets you own, the lower tax you pay, because what the government is saying is, we want you to invest your money back into uh, real assets, agriculture, energy, business, and real estate. And when you do that, you're gonna make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see it at the next town hall after this bill passes and we'll see you then. Um, please feel free to share this. This is being recorded, it's gonna be on YouTube. Please share it with your friends. Um, you have more questions, please contact us at WealthAbility.